Thank you very much. I thought somebody had kidnapped my <coughs> panelists. Um, the first request is, could we keep the lights up so that we can see who wants to speak from the, uh, from the platform? Uh, the idea now is that we open the, um, the session to the, to the floor. To the, uh, if you want to speak, could you please raise your hands? Uh, uh, I can see there's several, but uh, we'll move on. I'm going to start by asking the panelists if there's any short statement to continue, and then we'll follow um, the hands in the, uh, in the, uh, in the audience. So, um, Brendan, perhaps, I think you had one point to, to restart the match. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Norman. I, I just wanted to respond to this question of the European predicament as a heart attack, um, taking advantage of the presence of our cardiologist, um, and whether or not, you know, uh, the solution should be preventive or bringing the patient back from death. And I had two reflections there, to perhaps to also to help uh, stimulate discussion. One is that I think what we're seeing in Europe at the moment uh, is, is not really, is not a heart attack, not yet, that, that may follow, um, but it's more like a slow puncture, uh, where simply the air and the energy is leaching out of the system. So it's more like a wasting disease, and this is part of our problem, that the, the, uh, the crisis is not yet sufficiently acute uh, to concentrate minds. The second question concerns whether one should have preventive surgery or measures and, or to bring the patient back from death. I'm a little bit ambivalent about this, um, and I say what I'm about to say, I say with great caution, but I do believe that the only way we will solve the European problem for good uh, is within the context of the politics of catastrophe. In other words, what is required is so deep-rooted and so radical along the lines that I described in my remarks that it cannot really be done within the existing uh, political uh, and, if you like, ideological frameworks. And therefore, it may be, and as I say, I say this with ambivalence and hesitation, it may be that we actually need to have the crisis or the death first uh, before there can be a resurrection. Thank you very much. Um, John? Can I just disagree with Brendan? Because I've agreed with everything he said so far. I, Brendan... Uh, the danger with the crisis, waiting for the crisis is the outcome is not known. When the heart attack occurs, some people die completely unexpectedly through problems you can't foresee, bang, and the whole heart is gone. That's what concerns me. Uh, and I don't think we've got time to prevent. So we're in that window of the heart attacks just about to start on what do we do. I think it's got to be radical but it's got to respect the thing that these two chaps were saying, the, the status quo. And it's getting that balance right of radicality and uh, respecting the, the present situation. And it has to involve politicians. Uh, whether we have a completely new cadre of politicians or whether we try and persuade through discussion the, the present uh, order, I, 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 I don't know. But just what occurred to me is perhaps we want a conference of heads of states who, including the Queen and the President of Germany, to say, look, how, do we sort out our political class or not? Um, Jan, please. Well, I, I'm not sure I would like to entrust politicians to deal with my heart, let alone soul. <laughs> Even if this is Anna Palacio or President Dudkevich, I trust them very much, but I would rather, John, with my heart, go to you. <laughs> this is point one. And with my soul, a good question, eh? where I would go to. Uh, but but you, you, you said we have a cynical view with Leszek Czarnecki, but I think you, as a medic, you have to agree that the first thing is to, to make the right diagnosis. You have to acknowledge that there is a problem. The truth is that you go to Germany, there is no crisis, they don't think it's a problem, but the problem of not obeying rules and not 
living up to promises. You, this country also, people read newspapers, of course, they realize that there is a Euro, a Euro problem, but probably for many of you here in the audience, it sounds a little bit like discussion from another planet. And, and maybe because, as you rightly said, you are used to live with a crisis. And in fact, if you look, for instance, at Latvia, after 2008, they had a GDP growth 25%. No strikes, no manifestations, no request to buy them out. So obviously, there is a different economy of patients in different parts of Europe. But we cannot ignore the fact that if you go, Anna, to your country, youth unemployment, how high it is? People unemployed to 20, younger than 25 years? 40%. With no, 40% with no chance. You know, and you can blame as a German that, you know, uh, uh, Spanish pensioners that you know, they go too early uh, for, for retirement. But if they wouldn't go at the age of, what, 60, there would be not 40, but 60% youth unemployment. I mean, there is a problem here. Amanda, you? Uh, well, uh, Amanda Palacio, I'm a member, of, a member of the board of the Atlantic Council. And uh, I had a question, but I first will uh, explain about uh, about Spain, which is, in the, the uh, Brussels jargon, the country I know best. Um, and I was also minister in, in, in the Spanish uh, in government, the, so you have to be... Yeah, uh, the, in, a, in, a, I mean, in a former life. I mean, if you take Spain, and I said ye this yesterday, I mean, Spain is one of these countries with uh, Singapore and Hong Kong that has been that has been one of the big successes in the second half of the 20th century in terms of increase of GDP per capita. That's it, that, that's something that we tend to forget. Which means that we went from, uh, from, a, uh, a, from a situation of qualifying for, for uh, loans by the World Bank to just joining the, the, in the Euro. And this, I mean, this means that we, have, we still have many asymmetries. When you speak about unemployment in Spain, the first thing that you cannot forget is that when we were growing, when I was in government, not because of me, but when I was in government in 2000 to 2004, uh, Spain was growing at four point something percent. And yet we had a huge unemployment, very high unemployment. Why? We have a structural uh, problem there, and this is one of these asymmetries that we are addressing now, which is the rigidity of our labor market. So, yes, we have, I mean, we have an issue in which you can say that we need, uh, we need early retirement, but I, I really don't think that this, is the, that this is the issue. Spain has to have a more flexible uh, labor market because one of these paradoxes of, of politics, the ones that, that, that clung to the uh, fascist uh, labor la laws in Spain, labor laws that were inspired by the Carta del Lavoro, Mussolini's Carta del Lavoro, were the, the labor unions. Why? Because it, labor unions in Spain have a huge power, and this has been hindering our, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, our competitiveness. Another issue that is also has to be explained historically is that under Franco, we had a fantastic vocational training, but this was destroyed because it was Francoist, but we haven't replaced it. We created universities. Everybody was going to be a university uh, <coughs> student. And this is another issue that is hampering our growth. The third area is that Spain has has bet too much on services, uh, tourism services, and building, and we had this building, this building bubble that uh, just was punctured, and this is part of the issue. So, I don't think that there are easy explanations. Each country in Europe has its own history and its own issues, and what we know in Spain is that 
the, the reforms that this government is addressing are not reforms because of Brussels or because of, of Berlin. These reforms are reforms because we need that in order to be able to compete in a globalized economy. And we need to invest in R&D. And you know, in Spain, we have the paradox that we have the frontline uh, companies in areas like uh, renewable energies or even banking. But we have this, and at the same time, we don't have part of the same sector that is really has to be addressed. And these are the asymmetries that are, I mean, are, have to be understood in this, in this context. Now, this is for the explanation. May I make the question? Please do. But, so, I think that among the very interesting ideas that have been addressed by all of you, there is one that I hope that we reflect on it a, li a little further. And this is this idea of parties, uh, of parties that would be European, that would have English as the as the I mean the communication language, and I, th I honestly I think that the, these these parties are losers because of the situation in Europe. But even if they are losers, this is an idea that it would be worth same way that this European Academy that was I mean was thought and invented here. I and we need to go this way. And frankly, we cannot rely on the EPP or the PSC, the big leagues or international leagues of the big parties, because in the end, the power there relies on the national chapters. And the national chapters are not interested in having a European party that competes. But I think that if we could find some uh, means uh, some funding, because in the end this is an issue of funding. Uh, what we know is that you cannot create the European man, you are, I, we all agree, that this is an evolution that will take a long time, but that we have to address it, and I think that there is a room there in the political scenario for a party that will always lose, always, I mean, at least for the moment and for the years to come, but would be something that would just give this, uh, this idea in Europe. Take, uh, take all the elections in, for the European Parliament that, by the way, people care less and less because they don't see why they should go and vote uh, for the European Parliament, the participation is, is just uh, going down election after election. Could we, could we have a, a chance for an answer so, to... Yeah. Okay. Brendan, did you, so. <laughs> did you catch the question? I did indeed, and um, I'm very grateful uh, for, for your remarks, um, mm -hmm. which I take as an encouragement. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that such a party in the first instance would poll maybe one, two, three percent across the Union. Um, and this is why I made my point originally about the politics of catastrophe. Because I think such a party or such a movement established now, building up its profile over the next few years, could only gain. And as, and indeed we all expect this, the catastrophe unfolds, this party will then be in a position uh, to offer an answer. But it, it can't offer one, clearly, uh, until it's, it's actually been created. So I think it would have to go through a period of marginalization and of, uh, of bumping along very, long, very low in the polls. Um, but it could well be, after, as I say, this catastrophe, that it would then be in pole position. Thank you. I can see several hands. First, I think uh, President Lars uh, Waller of the uh, Academy. Thank you. I'm not going to comment on the current crisis or not on the economy, but take a much longer view. And uh, I think all the panelists missed one important point, which may be a little too boring for you in this context, maybe except John Martin, but he phrased it in a way which I, I would like to phrase it much more pragmatic. How can we create a new European? We need to create a pan, as far as possible, a pan-European culture. And how can that be done? By the educational system. I mean, maybe a crisis will make it more easy to create new institutions. But even if you believe, as I do, that it can be done gradually, uh, you have to create in, uh, a pan-European culture. And I think Norman Davis has started that process by writing his book on European history, which 
east and west. I would like, as I'm a Norwegian, although I'm president of the Academia Europea, I'm a Norwegian, so I would like to add north and south. But, uh, but a uh, history, and not only one book, but this should be part of the curriculum from the primary school up to the university studies. You have to create school books which have the European perspective. And this is, of course, a process which will involve teachers and academics and so on, and it will need uh, changes in the educational system. And then move on to other aspects of culture. For instance, the literature. We have to have some European main works which will be discussed in schools from the primary schools. Shakespeare will be mentioned, but not necessarily other British authors. Goethe will be there, but not necessarily Schiller and so on. You have to create a kind of uh, some important works in the European cultural history, which will have to be taught in school up to the university system. And then you have the universities and the movement of students, movement of researchers from one area to another. And this is to create, as far as possible, a pan-European culture. And then, of course, you have the problem with languages. We don't have one language. Of course, it would have been, for some of us, speaking broken English, it would be better if we had chosen Esperanto or some, which will put us all on the same background, or Latin, kept the Latin. But, but as it is, we have to go on with English. But that, in the other way, will make it in the future, when we have some common European culture, easier to include also transatlantic culture, the US in this context, the North America. And then we have development towards a more global development. Thank you. Thank you. Reaction? Um, Pan-European culture, education? Uh, Jan? Also media. I mean, one of the problems today in Europe is that we don't communicate across different policies. It's partly the reason of the language, but partly because, you know, the media are national media. You know, they... Uh, they are self-referential, and most of newspapers and TV stations are now basically uh, eliminated. With the, on the period of crisis, they just cut on foreign correspondents. I mean, Gazeta Wyborcza, one of the biggest European newspapers, have took foreign correspondents, right? Uh, so we could create, for instance, a uh, media equivalent of Erasmus program, to give opportunity to journalists to go to other countries you know, on sabbatical, and, and to, to not just to, to report from Brussels. I don't believe that the best way to do it is to create European media a la Euronews, you know, from mm -hmm. Brussels. I, I, this is exactly not to do this, the way to do this. But you should give an opportunity for mobility among journalists so there is an increased dialogue. And that kind of grassroots initiatives, but, but sponsored by the center, but self-governed by journalists rather than some officials, is the best way of doing those things. In academia, I find the best way which, has, uh, which, which was addressed this problem of education and, 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 and culture was to, cre to create a, a European Research Council, which is self-academics are, are, are running it on their own, but using European funds. Because, and, and the organization was created exactly not to, to give all the money to the European commissions, which was bureaucratic, which was basically not about academic things, but about other things. And, and, and European Research Council is a beautiful example on how you can create European program uh, which is self-governed by the community in question, which is pluralistic, but which uses incentives provided by the center, so to speak. Uh, Leszek, please. Uh, I can't agree more with you that uh, the solution is pan-European country. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the key issue, exactly as you said, is education. Why so? Because uh, once uh, we discuss uh, about collapsing parties, uh, request of creating new politicians, I'm afraid very much that having such a big rate of unemployment, uh, once those uh, parties uh, will fail during the next election, so I'm really worried who win next election if there wouldn't be some populist or even worse. 
And uh, I believe that maybe the solution for this uh, is education, is creating a new, new young generation people. And maybe this is the answer of our today's discussion, how to create the new Europeans. It's about to create creating a new young generation which also resolved the problem of language, although I half agree with you that the language is an issue because once we take, let's say, a California or Florida example, most of those people, they don't speak English there. And on the other hand, uh, let's take Latin America where, except Brasilia, they speak the same language, Spain, and doesn't help to create one country. So language is not an issue, but I agree with you that people at least need to be able to communicate. And once we put attention and focus on education of young people, that definitely might help to create a new Europeans, follow the new ideas of pan-European country. I'll speak very quickly because there were at least 10 people had their hands up, uh, not Norman, with questions. Uh, Culture is immensely important. Uh, the media is immensely important. One of the best programs in Europe is Arte, where you have a very good film, both in, in uh, German and French, at the same time with the alternative subtitles. That's the sort of thing that I love. But we are in confident with European culture. We don't like to say it is better than any other culture. We're holding ourselves back. We're giving lots amount of money in my country for... Uh, for, for example, Islamic culture uh, and literature to be put forward to the people. We have to believe in European culture and we have to project it in a form of soft power. Thank you. The next question on the front row. Yes, Lanka, I'm a physicist, I'm a professor in physics, and, and I'm, I'm telling that because my comment will be uh, very much related to my science. And, and I'm, I'm well, for those in Wrocław, they may know that I'm uh, on invitation of, of the mayor Dutkiewicz and trying to help him to make uh, this city number one place in terms of academic and innovation place in, in Central Europe. Anyhow, uh, about 50 or 60, 70 years ago, it was uh, another seminar but in physics. Uh, at that time, the name of Norman Davies was Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel Prize winner, and uh, the seminar was on the very beginning of quantum mechanics. It was a young fellow coming, and like Brendan, presenting a um, very visionary and very it's a touchy story. And then he came to Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel Prize laureate, and he said, uh, Herr Professor, uh, how do you like my theory? And uh, uh, Wolfgang Pauli looked through, through the eyes of the young man and said, yes, that's most interesting, but this is not crazy enough to be true. Okay, uh, this is the beginning, and why I'm saying so. Because you can take it as the anecdote for media, but this, as I'm a physicist, and the comment of Pauli was uh, much deeper than just an anecdote. The point is that that gentleman missed one of the most important variables in his equations. So if I looked through the eyes of uh, <coughs> Mr. Czarnecki, and if you have your accountant, and if this accountant in your bank misses 50% of your assets and 40% of uh, your liquidity, uh, and so what would you do? It Perhaps the next day he will be completely out of your bank because he misses the most essential uh, balance of the system. So my feeling is that we are in uh, not an accidental conference. This is a conference of transatlantic. So my feeling is that the question is not about the men of Europe for the future, <coughs> oh, future European men, but the <coughs> future Western men. Look, today, if I call the United States, I don't know that this is a a couple of thousand miles away. Because today technology is just instant. If I want to buy a ticket to New York, it's cheaper for me to go to New York than to Brussels. Really. So the length, uh, physical length, it, it's, it's nothing. It's just sorry to say the sun is not good for us. So my point is simply what we are missing. We are talking here Europe. But how can we miss 
enormous part of Western culture, Western system, Western thinking, which is just across the Atlantic. If you take the distance from California to, let's say, uh, Polish border, so this is more or less the same distance as from Polish border to Kamchatka. And Russia is just one state. So the point I want to say is the following. I don't think that this is proper and useful to discuss about our European internal affairs in our own source. It's much wiser, and I'm, I'm saying I was shocked during this conference that there was really not a single comment from the American side on the current European crisis, nor I would say even more. If I know quite a lot about the, the science uh, collaboration at the level of the European Union. The collaboration between the United States, which is life and bread for each of us, I mean, we've been on both sides of the Atlantic, is less than 5% of all money that the Union spends on research in Europe. It's a nonsense. It's a nonsense. The politicians are talking like, you know, it's a dollar country and this is Euro country. But we are talking the same language. So my point is simply that we are missing the most essential variable in the equation. If you want to solve our problems, this is the point. America and Europe must act together. Otherwise, in 30 years, we will be speaking Chinese. And this will be not English, Chinese, the Mandarin will be the major country. And the last point, I'm sorry that I'm talking too long. Uh, in your story, everybody loved it, I love this, that you had the president who has the Polish name, but completely wrong name, sorry. If you want to have a Polish name, you have your neighbor. Who could be that man? Why? For very simple reasons. Today, bankers are not stupid, greedy guys. They are very well educated. You have an example of the man who has a very high education, and he has created from scratch a, a, an empire. You had Mr. Kulczyk in Poland, exactly the same story. And the point is that today, bankers realize that the crash of Europe a Eurozone, and the crash between the United States. Uh, it's a killing, not only of their business, but this is a killing of their life. So, so I believe that you may create another story which will be more crazy and therefore more realistic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting intervention. Uh, I'm reminded of the brief interview that Gandhi gave when he first came to Europe in 1925. He, I think he landed at Marseille and he was going to London on the train. And a journalist caught him and put the microphone in front of his face and said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And Gandhi replied, it would be a nice idea. <laughs> John. I, I, I agree and disagree with you. Uh, I agree that the, the great power base of the future has to be Europe and the United States. But I've been amazed working in Yale of the differences that are not obvious. Uh, I was at dinner with a group of 12 liberal doctors, all professors in Yale, discussing capital punishment. It was obvious to all of them that murderers should be executed. They should be wiped out. I said, look, I'm shocked, gentlemen. This conversation could not occur at any dinner table of professors in Europe. And there are, were, there are some fundamental differences that have arisen, wasn't always that have arisen, between European culture and American culture that we have to be aware of. Thank you. Uh, Brendan. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for that question. And indeed, in my reply, I can also tie in uh, a response on, on the pan-European culture because, because they're related. Um, I completely agree that there's a huge amount to be learned from across the Atlantic. And my argument for a uh, democratic union is based on the assumption that what Europe needs is the importation, or if you like, the re-importation of Anglo-American constitutional principles. Um, I could explain if we had more time how the European situation at the moment is very similar to that which led to the, uh, Europe, uh, the American uh, Constitutional Convention in 1787-88. Uh, I would put, by the way, on my canon of European texts, uh, the American Federalist Papers, which map out exactly the reason why a more perfect union uh, was needed. I'd be a little bit careful about a European educational system, because I think we already have many 
good educational systems and we also have uh, possibility for diversity. For example, in, in my own country, my adopted country, uh, Scotland and England have different education systems without any particular disadvantage. In Germany, of course, education is a Landes uh, Hoheit. So I think these could be, uh, could be combined. As to whether we would have a, a European history book, um, a few years ago I sat down I tried to conceive such a book because I was impressed by a book which was very popular in the early 20th century, Our Island Story in Britain. And I thought, well, it's about time somebody wrote a book called Our European Story. I hope Norman won't steal this <laughs> exact title, uh, although in a sense he's already, he's already written this book. Um, but then I thought, well, actually, we don't have a common European story. The whole point is, is that our stories are, are manifold and diverse, and that our story has yet to be written. And I guess that's why we're here. If we could press on. There was a question on the third row here. Yes, sir. And then I'll move to the back. If you, uh, as soon as we finish, if you could put your hands up, I'll, I'll choose a victim. Well, do you listen? Do you hear me? Yes, okay. My name is Misidorovic. Uh, well, I want to go back to the title, a bit provocative in this country, when you, th when you think about creating new European. Because in this country, we have survived this experiment when the communists tried to build new so homo sovieticus or new society. But I look at the European, Europe in the quite different perspective and the social process which is taking place. Have a look. It, some years ago, we gave people possibility to know each other much better. They can travel without borders. They can change their stereotypes. And what will be the result of this process is very difficult to say. Is it the way to create quite new vision of uh, countries and quite new routes of integration which is taking place here? So I, w I am a bit surprised that, that it is such a political uh, uh, um, role in, the, in your discussion. Because I think that the social process, not only individuals, but also cooperation, integration, social trust, social capital, this is something what can create new Europe. And I think that one of the reasons of the crisis is this losing the vision of uh, social process. So I don't you think so? That's my question. Uh, thank you. Um, the title was deliberately pro provocative. <laughs> um, the issue of um, the dimension of social consent, I think, was the, the heart of that question. Anybody wish to re respond? Question, uh, we'll think about it in that case. We'll perhaps come back to them. Uh, yes, sir, in the, uh, in the middle, uh, please. I'm a German, and I'm one of those who calculate the GDP, and I'm a guest professor here. I liked it very much what John Martin said, but I'm a little bit skeptical. You said that you spoke with the students and they want to have the new system now, and you need a new idea and it will come relatively quickly. There was someone who had a new idea, this was Montesquieu, and we spoke in the last days a lot about democracy, and now look what the new idea brought with it. His idea was in 1748, and how many countries are democratic today? So it takes a time. I'm skeptical that you can be quicker as you said it. Of course I agree with you, but there are ideas and ideas. The principle is, if you don't have an idea, you don't go anywhere. You're just wandering around in the dark as we are now. It's a question of defining the idea and then criticizing it. Uh, and in terms of democracy, I think the best democratic system ever was Iceland, who in the year 1000, all the whole country met in a big field, debated whether they should remain pagans or become Christians. They had a vote on it everybody over the age of 16 and they voted will become Christians and they all became Christians. 
if we could return, that's a fabulous idea of the nature of democracy, and the idea they were, were they, they were discussing was paganism versus Christianity. We've got to get back somehow to that, and that anal an analytical criticism of idea, I, and I don't see how we do it, but we've got to do it in some way. I'm sorry. The question in Iceland at that time it was serious one. None of these questions is as serious as that one. So, so. Yeah. I, I think I think that's because of the state of development of civilization. We're all so sophisticated now. We're all communicating with iPads. We're in a different stage, and life is immensely more complex than it was for the Icelanders. That's the difficulty in discovering the idea and analysing it. Yes, so with the sheet, the sheet in your hand, thank you. Thank you. My name is Andrzej Dulka. I'm from Alcatel St. Paul, and I have a question and disagreement with Mr. Zielonka. So I will start with the disagreement and come to the question. I disagree that the early reti late retirements creates unemployment. On contrary, early, early retirement creates unemployment. And the dynamics is very simple. Early retirement is money, it costs, the, the pension cost. They have to be added somewhere. They are added to the cost of the entrepreneur girls that have to create new jobs. And unfortunately, the cost of, of the retired people is added to the low and low cost uh, uh, workers and it cuts the low jobs. So on contrary, early retirement creates unemployment. This is my disagreement. Now the question. I fully agree with you that we shouldn't uh, hamper or shouldn't uh, navigate with the genes of our, uh, uh, of our uh, social system in the meaning of giving their direction. Yeah? Because you could end with having Mr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, if you, if, you, if you set the direction. But do you observe a direction? Do you observe a, an arrow of direction in the current political system? in Europe that gives us some hints what could be the future possible European, yeah? I, I would say in Poland it could be Mr. Palikot with the totally new uh, thinking, but I, many questions here, yeah? Do you see that, that such direction in Europe? Could you identify? Is it visible today? Look, I'm not going into the details how you deal with unemployment and retirement. I leave it to people who know more about this. I wanted just to, to, to make a different point why I mentioned this. Just to make long story short, if you look at countries like Greece or Spain, whether you put the blame for the mess they are in on the German or French bankers, or on retired people sitting in the sun, you know, age 55 and drinking gozo. There is no scientific answer to this. There's no theory will tell you who is right. It's ideology which tell you who is right. If you're social democrats, you give, or you know, you are on the left, you give blame to the to the bankers. If you are on the right, you will give give uh, blame to the pensioners. This is the only thing I wanted to say that a lot of those things are not, there is no scientific answer. And here is the difference, you know, I have with the analogy of science, including medical science, yeah? Um, I hope there is something like science when I go to John to check my heart. But in political world, there is no answer which is scientific. What is the course to proceed is what we agree collectively is correct way to, to do. And this is exactly what was the difference between Montesquieu and Rousseau. Rousseau believed that there is a general will and it's only for political elites to discover it and they know what, where to go to. And Montesquieu was saying, no, it's more complicated. You have to, you know, you, you need to have a, a different you know, you have to spread the power between different institutions and what is the national interest is not given, it is what is being negotiated and decided. 
And then, of course, you ask also the questions, what about minorities, those who, who, who are outvoted in democracy, how their rights are being protected, and how to make them cooperate with the majority will. So you see, when you ask me now about what is the idea, it's not, you know, we can all have a brilliant idea. When Mr. Czarnecki is a brilliant idea, he knows how to, how to uh, deal with it, how to know that this is a brilliant idea, because it either makes profit or it makes loss. So simple like this. I mean, it's probably not so simple, but, but at the end of the day, you know that. Investor yeah. But <laughs> with politicians, you know, it is not that you, like, Mr. Politico can have an idea, but he needs to, to get electorate behind this idea. And in Europe, things are more complicated. Because you see, what you, the, the, you know, try to, to, you know, the electoral kind of process is only within the nation state. The markets are not very much interested in who is elected politicians yesterday or tomorrow in Greece. Okay? And there is no European polity, basically, of, of a workable kind of nature, which could replace the national polity. So there's this, this, this junctions between different theaters. And then I finish because I see the Norman is getting nervous. <laughs> You know, so there is this theater with different logic and scale in economics. Scale is global, logic is profit. There is, there is political, where, 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 it, where it's basically confined to nation states because this is where democracy is. And there is, you know, European level that, that you know, leaders of states can come and make a law, but they, whether they are implemented or whether the market will follow it, you know, how many times they try to reassure the market about the strength of the euro? And the market will come for a day or two. And you know what about the electorate. So you see, these are different theaters. They, 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 different operas are being played there with different actors. And sometimes, you know, they meet. But most of the time, not at the same time, and with pervert results. This is where we are. Yes, in the middle here, please. We have... A Roughly 20 minutes. Um, if you could make your questions reasonably short, we'll okay, I'll try. cover more. Tomasz Boyski, Polish Center for African Studies. I would like to ask you, what will be the idea that, you, because you go back and forward on it, I would like you to specify what will be the idea on which we'll be, build this common identity for Europe that we could all share on and build a new country on. And the second thing, demography. Nobody mentioned the problem that we don't have enough newborn within the Europe. Where will take the new Europeans from? Thank you. The, the idea would be that before we can take political action, we have to specify what is a human being. We've got to the stage of development of society through half a million years of evolution where we can start to ask this question. This question is important for the whole world. Europe particularly can specify the nature of the human being because of the last thousand years of development of European thought. I proposed it was a certain aspect of the individual and culture, but the idea is that the European people with their joint brain can specify the true nature of the human being on which future political action can be based. And that idea has to be turned into a concept that is acceptable through the media to the population. But I think it's something that can be made attractive and is very important. Uh, sir, in the, in the middle, yes, please. Thank you. Bartosz Cichocki, National Security Bureau, Poland. Uh, first, let me say your panel proved Bismarck was wrong when, when he said, in this Achtung macht sich Professoren und Vaterland, du bist verloren. Uh, 88 professors and oh motherland you are lost but more seriously i i liked your scenario professor sims we do uh, these kinds of scenarios in offices like like i'm working in and and your scenario would belong to to the probable ones not not to the unprobables one but i may i suggest one correction I believe the, uh, the new union's army and new union's institutions 
would consolidate, not confronted by the outside old type, let's say, Russian Belarusian structure, but confronted by guerrillas uh, from within its territory. In other words, European soldiers of Polish, German, French origins would fight Poles, Germans, French, defending status quo. And it would help me uh, professionally. Uh, because, and and it, it's, it's important difference between then, it, we realized that it would take quite amount of our blood to exit the, the wonderland once and for good. Uh, and it, it would help me professionally if you developed your scenario, and if Ambassador Feinstein is, is with us, if he could join uh, to the point whether the U.S. would engage in the European civil war and, and on which side. Thank you. I think that's one for Brendan, having talked about uh, uh, the future war. Thank, thank, thank you very much for the, for the question, the um, remarks and, and the spirit in which they were offered. I, I won't engage too far in speculation, um, having already advanced um, quite some distance, but I'll, I'll comment on your, what you've said. Um, I think there's a, a definite possibility that a future European army would be engaged in domestic activities. I, I would prefer to, to think that that would be dealing, say, with the problem of, of international or homegrown terrorism rather than acting as a police force against, uh, you know, disaffected more generally within the Union. That would take us in the direction of what Norman was talking about earlier, uh, post-1860 Italy where, of course, the new Italian army spent most of its time dealing with brigands uh, in Naples and Sicily. And that, that seems to me not a very <laughs> a positive uh, future for a European army. Um, and I think that the United States uh, benefited very much from external wars uh, binding it uh, together. Uh, not, not challenges that it sought, but challenges which existed and which it met. On Bismarck, um, of course, his, his comments on professors uh, related to the experience of the 1848 revolutions in Germany, which famously were a failure as, because they didn't create a united Germany. Again, this may not be uh, an auspicious <laughs> historical precedent, but it might be in the sense that what was conceived of and thought of in 1848 and derided as a failure later came to be. So that in that sense, B Bismarck uh, was forced to eat his words. I conclude with something else he said, which is when, uh, this may be apocryphal, but it is said that when he was asked what the most significant uh, event uh, in world history had been, he said the fact that the new United States after 1783 victory in the war uh, chose English or remained with English as their language. Um, and I'm hoping, of course, that when we create uh, the Democratic Union, the future Bismarck will say, um, that its, uh, its most important achievement was that it had English as its language. I can meet a lot of people. For, for example, I'm a volunteer here because uh, I want to learn something new and uh, I have met a lot of people like me uh, who, who have uh, these new bright ideas and I think that we shouldn't create new European but we should uh, work with that what we already have because uh, you really can meet a lot of new students uh, abroad Europe who travel, who learn new languages, who think differently, maybe than politicians, than um, scientists. So maybe this is the case, that we should use what we have, not to create the new European. Thank you. Thank you. We already have the new Europeans. Um, we need to multiply them rather than create new ones. Uh, John? What, what a wonderful comment from a, uh, a young woman. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, in my laboratory, I have 24 people. Uh, 18 of them are Europeans, not from England. And they're all talking together, living together, and they're, they're doing what you say. The problem is there's a disconnect between that group and uh, Cameron, our uh, prime minister, who is slightly Eurosceptic because he has to please the extreme right wing of the Conservative Party to keep his votes in Parliament. And that group want all the English to go back to drinking warm beer and having bulldogs and never going to the continent for their holidays. So what you say is true, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you say it, but the problem is how do we get the political class to understand 
that already what Brendan is saying is starting to exist in people under 25 across Europe? A wonderful, optimistic question. Thank you. I would add that the, uh, there is a European uh, uh, class in Brussels. Uh, you go there, there's a, tens of thousands of, of people who accept uh, the priority, as, as it were, of Europeanness in, in, their, in their makeup, and they speak all sorts of languages and they mix together as uh, I think you do. Uh, the problem is that this Europeanness is in little patches here and there. John's laboratory sounds to be one. Uh, the European uh, bureaucracy might be another. Uh, but the, can we say, we are still a small minority. And the point is, how do we expand this? Uh, I can't see any hands at the moment. Aha, uh -huh. Fran, yes, obviously. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm really kind of surprised that we've talked about European culture as much as we have, and no one's mentioned the Eurovision Song Contest or Euro 2012. <laughs> a lot of people watch it, and one shouldn't dismiss uh, Eurovision precisely because of that reason. Um, I wanted to make a couple comments on the idea of educating for a new European. In the US, what we have is what were known as civics classes. Everyone goes and takes these classes in high school. It's one of the few unifying things across our education system. They're taught a bit differently in each state. I won't say that they're always exactly right historically. They are more about the myths we teach ourselves as Americans, but they do contribute. What's happened now is that with technology as it is, everyone can go to the commentators and the other sources of knowledge that they are most comfortable with. And so we're seeing in the American political system a disaggregation, I would say, of this, and a polarization, because it's normal human instinct to go and talk to the person who disagrees with you only a little rather than a lot, or who, who affirms your views. And so now we have in the American political discourse people starting not just with different opinions, but different facts. And this has, I think, overridden the unifying effort of our educational system, which is a very diverse system to start with. So as you ask, what should the European educational system do? I think you have to also ask yourself, what do the new technologies do? Can we use those, or can we, do we have to be aware of those? Um, I also wanted to s say a word about the European Parliament elections. The numbers are actually not that far off congressional elections in an off year. We get only relatively decent turnout, and we're not known for great turnout, um, when we have a president. So instead of just a presidential election, so instead of just going for a party, I would encourage my European colleagues to think about a European presidential contest, electoral contest, directly. And finally, I just wanted to say to John, that I'm not sure about the particular program that you were talking about uh, funding uh, Islamic culture, but I couldn't disagree with you more in terms of governments in Europe funding a more diverse view of culture. Europe is itself becoming much more diverse. And as you have more citizens who come from diverse backgrounds, you need to understand their cultures and engage with their cultures. So it's not only about um, the culture of the past of Europe, but the culture that is the future of Europe. And I, I would love to hear the panel think about how to be inclusive in those regards with uh, the new Europeans who are already here from all over. Thank you very much. I heard two key words. One was <coughs> disaggregation. Uh, fragmentation, uh, and the other was inclusivity. Does anybody want to, on the panel? Um, well, so, perhaps so, Le Leszek, are okay. you, uh, were you just waving your arm or were you volunteering? <laughs> oh, for Jan, okay. Uh, uh, Jan, yes, please. I think John should have a chance to respond to something, but I, I fully agree with those, not only you, but also you, who argue against Euro-nationalism, 
There's no point to do this. Example, sh you know, our reference point could be America, but not only America. Turkey, Norman knows something about Turkey and European Turkey's past, Russia, but also others. You know, if you ask me, what is the prototype of a kind of culture and exchange of information which is truly pan-national, I tell you my favorite television is, not BBC, Australian SBS. You know, I don't know where any of you is aware of Australian SBS. This is the TV channel sponsored by the state where I can see news in Sydney or Melbourne from Poland, from Russia, from London, not only news, but also films. You know, on BBC, I can only see British films and, and, and Hollywood crap, allowed me to say this. <laughs> there, I can see uh, some Hollywood, but I can see also Turkish movies, Polish movies, French movies, because they are so multicultural in their approach, and this wouldn't be possible without some support of, of the state, and because commercial television wouldn't just go this road. So, I said, this gives me opportunity to a little bit uh, qualify my views before, because when I said before, I was very cautious to say we don't want somebody to engineer from outside our souls, you know, and, 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 and background. But of course, I believe that you need some kind of public intervention to, 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 to make things happen, which otherwise commercial, polit uh, commercial logic wouldn't allow. No. Yes, F F Fran, I accept your criticism, and it would be correct if I was saying that we should not fund Islamic culture. I think uh, Islam, particularly in art, in its abstraction, has a lot to offer uh, European art and European culture. Well, se secondly, I live in London, which I think is the most diverse city in the world. Now, it's very exciting. Between 25 and 20% of all people in London are not British. Uh, and we have the possibility there of building a new society of the fusion of everything, particularly idea. The problem is a society within what structure? And I'm very aware, as someone who lives in London, we've got to have a structure of law and behavior and interaction that I think has to be British or European. And it's in that context, I say, we have to define what is the European ideal, and we have been too inconfident to say, this is our cultural heritage, and we can accept nearly anything into that, but we have to have a structure within which that is determined. Otherwise, in London, we might have anarchy. Brendan, please. Yes, I, I'd like to agree with uh, Fran as well, um, and just to make the point that uh, one can see that Islam uh, and Europe um, are completely compatible uh, in the case of uh, two countries, um, which are the countries with the highest uh, proportion of Muslims in Europe. Um, they're also the most pro-American countries in Europe. Um, they're also extremely pro-European. As a matter of interest, does anybody know which countries I'm referring to? Any ideas? France, France Turkey. No, Turk no. Within Europe. Denmark. No. Bosnia and Albania. Now, so it's an interesting fact. Also, uh, the most uh, anti-Muslim country is also the most anti-American. Does anybody know which country that is? Serbia. Ah, there are two. Serbia and Greece, for the same, same broad reason. So the point, I'm simply making the point that the idea of a contradiction between Islam and Europe or Islam and democracy uh, per se, um, I think is not given. And what we see in Bosnia is, uh, if you like, a fusion between European culture. You've got uh, Renaissance and Baroque uh, mosques, at least the ones that survive uh, in the Federation uh, area. So what I think is really important, though, is that we do what the Americans have done, achieved, which is that you can have all kinds of different linguistic cultural influences, but they have a political core. They believe in their political common project, and there is no ambiguity or ambivalence about that. So I would say, I would actually throw open the gates of Europe uh, conditionally, and I would make it actually a condition of remaining as well, even if you were born in Europe, uh, that you should subscribe to the political project, which should be democratic, 
It should have a certain view on the rights of women and other issues that we regard as our uh, po uh, you know, Western uh, political heritage. And that's, that's the key thing we should focus on rather than culture as such. Thank you very much. We're nearly at the end. I'm going to ask the, the panel if they have any final remarks. Uh, and if we're approaching the, uh, the close. Um, Leszek, you haven't said anything in the last five minutes. Could you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. I say something uh, regarding to uh, what Brandon said, that uh, as far as uh, Bosnia or uh, Albania are concerned, first of all, they are not members of the European Union. So probably the way we choose is a correct one, first of all, to focusing on the, exactly the same uh, ideas. And then once uh, the country is uh, fit to, to the union, then we allow them to, to enter. Uh, so I can't agree more that, first of all, we, we have to focus on ideas, on the political system, on the common consensus, then the culture difference. Thank you. Um, I see no hands. The axe falls. Uh, it, uh, John, okay. Can you I just deserve concentrate one what I've said? And so you mentioned women. Uh, and, and I think that if we think, if we're making a new man, which includes women, if we're doing that with a new European culture, the understanding of the true equal role of women in society comes from a European tradition, not from an Islamic tradition, Fran. So it's a question of both ways, now having confidence in our, our own culture. And, and the role of women, to me, is key. That has come from Europe, and we have to have confidence in our culture in saying to others, stop. And, and uh, uh, Miss Bonino said it very strongly yesterday at the, uh, at the dinner, uh, and that, that she was saying something then, very European, which wouldn't have been said by an Arab or an African politician. Well, thank you very much. I'm not certain that we've come to a, a crystal clear conclusion, but we certainly provoked quite a, a, a number of very interesting comments. Um, uh, there will be a press release, I think, after this. Um, we also have a nascent website, which may... Um, uh, play some part uh, soon. Um, this has been very much an experiment for us, but uh, we're very happy in the way it has gone. We're very grateful to the organizers of the Global, Global Forum, City of Rotswath and the Atlantic Ca uh, Council. I'm very grateful to the panelists, Brendan Sims, Leszek Czarnicki, Jan Zielonka, and above all, J John Martin, whose idea this was. Uh, I think the feeling is that, if possible, we will repeat this exercise next year, but on a completely different topic. Thanks, above all, to the audience for being here, for asking interesting questions. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We certainly have. Bardzo dziękuję. Do widzenia.